Hello, everyone. Is this thing on? Are we here? It's on. Let me refresh the page. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, just give me a second here. Apparently, we have 34 people watching the live stream right now at home, and we are so, so, so glad that you're here. Um, hopefully, more people will be joining us as the time goes by. Um, right now, we have a couple of the family members in the audience, but we wanted to make you guys feel at home. Uh, so I will be here entertaining you for as long as uh, half an hour, but we will have some of our crew members and student speakers come up here and engage with you all as well. Um, yeah, so I'm just super happy you're here. And the first person who will be joining us up here is Francis, who is a part of the tech team and helping this whole entire event happen. So please, everyone in the chat, give your support to Francis. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I've seen a lot of excitement in the comments, which is awesome. Weird to see me on the screen right now. Um, some people saying that this is their this is going to be their first TEDx event. And to those people, you're in for a treat. Uh, if you've been here in the past, you're going to see a lot of the same charm of the of what we've done in the past, but a lot of some new stuff as well. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> all right, so where are we all viewing from? Is everybody in the Monterey area? Are there people, you know, around? I wanna know. Mr. Mr. Zeljo, it's gonna be your first TEDx, your TEDx. Oh, you're gonna love it. It's awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone else as everyone as well, Lauren. You're from you're in Beijing right now, Alan. That's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. Thank you so much for you know coming from Beijing. Frankie, you're in Monterey. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> yes, lots of moms in the chat today, Mr. Raymond. Um, Seaside. All right, um, Seth is really wanting to come up and talk to you guys. Oh, Wesley. Awesome, Wesley. All right, Seth is here looking to talk to you guys, so we're going to pass the mic. Um, hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know, I am Seth. I am a current senior. Um, see, I see that Francis already asked the question I was planning to ask of where is everyone coming from? <laughs> Um, so yes, hello everyone, ni hao, hola. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Maybe we could go with um, what you are most looking forward to tonight. Like if there's a certain speaker you're looking forward to hearing from, um, that kind of thing, or just being excited in general. Sophia, yeah, Sophia, hello Sophia. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so if you didn't hear Mr. Brickhauser saying that Sophia did a TED talk in the past, so this is a quick shout out to a past TEDx York speaker. Yeah, Aiden is looking forward to all speakers, I agree. Um, during the rehearsals, I, the other speakers, I've been really excited to hear their talks and I'm excited for everyone else to hear them. Yes, Sophia, we all miss you too. Yes, Normandy is looking forward to Miss Sherry's. Yes, as you should, Miss Sherry has an absolutely amazing speech. Um, so it's been really, really cool to hear. We also have, um, for those of you who don't know, we have two community speakers and both of their speeches are absolutely, or both of their talks are absolutely amazing. Um, so I can't wait for you guys to hear those as well. Um, and I think I will hand this off to Courtney now. I really wish I had something prepared for this. Just thought of some really good questions to ask everyone. 
Oh, I didn't. Pizza topping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, favorite pizza topping. What's your favorite pizza? Oh, no, no. Favorite pizza place on the peninsula? That's a solid question, right? What? CPK? Yes, that's always, always a solid. Ooh, where is that? Is it? It's called the oven. Michael the Kennedy. The oven. Lay's Pizza. Give a shout out to Michael Kennedy. Shout out to Michael Kennedy. <laughs> He's an alum. He's awesome. Hi, hi from York School. <laughs> Washington's pretty far away. Wait, do we do we already maintain decide who is the farthest viewer? Right now? Is it Shang? Oh, Shanghai. Okay, yeah. Right. Beijing? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever had it, but like Trader Joe's has a really good pre made pizza dough. That's kind of an option. Pizza Hut, Little Caesars, Margarita. Love you too, Sophia. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a lot of good pizza places here. We've got a lot of good cuisine in the <laughs> in the county. Okay, does anyone have the from the audience have a good question to ask the live stream? Oh yes, of course, Costco pizza. I mean, well, how did we forget? Yeah, how did we forget to mention Costco pizza? I feel, I feel like I've I've betrayed their trust. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so next, Grace is going to take over for me. So thank you guys for putting up for me. <laughs> All right, everyone, I'm back. Surprise, surprise. Um, I think it's so awesome that you guys are actually engaging with uh, the chat. And hopefully the whole idea of this is that you would continue to be a part of the conversation uh, with each other, with the people you're watching the event with at home um, and also with the community we have online since um, of course we weren't able to gather here in this space um, previously in the past five years um, we've had like a reception where you can mingle around and drink some beverages and eat hors d'oeuvres um, but hopefully you got those things with you all at home this time um, Ash is excited for the speeches. I'm so glad that you're here, Ash. And shout out Michael Kennedy, graduated the same year as me, watching all the way from Washington. So hope you're doing well, Michael. Um, okay, more more combos about pizza. Uh, Gianni's New Monterey, you know. Uh, Kevin Brookhauser loves Kirkland. And um, if you don't know this about Kevin Brookhauser, he is one of the co-organizers of this event and he's a big Kirkland fan. Uh, he's a big Google fan. So fun facts about Mr. Brookhauser here. Um, Heather Oliver, Costco Pizza fuels the robotics team. And you know what? Costco has fueled us tonight because thank you to Heather Oliver. She brought us pizza for dinner. So we're super, super grateful for her. Yeah, woo! <laughs> All right. Oh, we have someone named Lisa who is also up in Washington. So thank you for showing up here, Lisa. I don't know who you are, but thank you for coming. Um, Sean Raymond said, hi, MK. I assume he's talking hi to Michael Kennedy. Um, we got some family members arriving here in the space. So welcome to all the people who are coming in here today. Um, anything else? What are you the most excited about tonight? Or are you, are you looking forward to a certain talk? Have you seen our social media posts? Um, anything like that? Any, any, any questions? Are you excited? Hopefully you're excited. Pizza. Yeah, Frankie loves pizza. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we love pizza. Bodhi, everything. It's good to be excited for everything. Kate says, excited to be surprised by all of the amazing speeches. Yes. I think we have so much in store for us tonight. We have a bunch of or not a bunch. Well, we have a good <laughs> variety of talks covering different topics, and um, hopefully they will get you to think uh, about the world 
around you and then also maybe what's going on in your own life too. Oh, um, okay. Oh, wow, 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 the chat's moving fast. Okay, for an actual live York performance on campus. Yes, yeah, so um, we did have an event, but everything was like pre-recorded. That was the York auction. Uh, so we are doing this live, we are streaming this live. And so it's cool that we're able to kind of have both. And I like to think about it, like the people who are in this room are watching like a live production, sort of like on Ellen or something like that. So it's going to be very organic in that sense, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Heather says, that she's loved the ones in the past, always a creative take on interesting subjects. And I totally agree with that. Um, people definitely have a way with their words. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. Uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, class of 91. Thank you for coming here. Uh, great to have alums around. Excited to hear what you all have to share. I'm excited for you to be here. And Pizza Train. Okay, Frankie is still really loving pizza. <laughs> um, I'm happy for you, Frankie that you love pizza. Uh, Jonathan, excited about what new things we are going to see. Yes, yes, you're definitely going to hear about a couple of new things. Um, somebody ordered Jay-Z a pizza. Yeah, Jay-Z said he was foregoing dinner to watch this event, but Jay-Z, uh, highly recommend, you know, you can, you can bring your laptop or whatever, make yourself a meal or a snack or something and then make yourself comfortable so that you can feel your body as well uh don't forget to take care of yourself you know we all got to eat um yes okay aaron white smiley face glad you're here aaron um people are people are talking about uh me and how i'm doing great you know i'm trying everyone well there's okay Oh, Mr. Dan, making a comment about my fashion. Oh, wow. I'm honored. <laughs> you know, I'm really like the comfy casual person. So it's hard for me to be fashionable sometimes. We have a, a laptop at their dinner table, says Aaron. And yeah, I think this is like the new way to stay connected. We used to say like, oh, no screens at the dinner table. But uh, now we're bringing screens to the dinner table so that we can experience something together. Um, so that's cool. Uh, can we put on requests for autographs? Maybe uh, for the people who are here in the room, uh, if you want an autograph, maybe you can maybe you can ask the people afterwards if you can get their autograph, but I can't really speak for them. <laughs> so yeah, does anybody uh, want to potentially uh, talk to the people? Okay, yeah, so Kevin Brookhauser, everyone, the uh, Google connoisseur, Kirkland lover, <laughs> um, co-owner, or not co-owner, co-organizer of TEDx. <laughs> oh my goodness. We were so worried when we were going to do this live chat thing at the beginning, like, would anyone show up? And look at you guys, this is great. Um, I also, I, I need to give a shout out, Jennifer Gonzalez, good friend of mine, Class of 91, that's awesome. Eric Bodie, so glad you're here. We're at the dinner table at the White family. That is amazing. What are you guys serving, Aaron? I'd, I'd love to know. Oh, uh, there's Ray Ray. Remember when people used to call Mr. Raymond Ray Ray? He's been trying to get rid of that, I think, for a while. Um, let's see. Now it's going to come back. Sorry. Let's see, who else? We got Aiden O'Brien. Aiden, Aiden and I go way back on the mountain bike trail all year long. We've been biking throughout Fort Ord. Good to see you there. Jay-Z, what's up? Oh, I've got a challenge for you all uh, in the chat. Um, what emoji expresses uh, your feelings right now? Find that emoji. And if you don't know how to do an emoji, um, just click that little smiley face on the, in the keyboard. Or if you're on a, on a, on a laptop, right-click your cursor, and it probably will say emoji, and then you can choose from there. Happy face under the text bar. Text squad, represent! Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the ranch debate later, but let's see these. <laughs> These emoji, oh, the head exploding. That's a good one. 
Um, I'm actually going to put in, I'm going to see if I can find my favorite one. I'm actually in a kind of a burner account right now, library, but anyway, you'll see it. Oh, wait, this is really difficult. Oh, there it is. Uh, I love the, the, the woman who's dancing with the red dress. That's my favorite one. Where is that one? I can't str stroll through it. Oh, look, there's, is that someone doing the, um, what is that? What is that? That, does anyone still do that? Is that what that's called? No one does it anymore. Jump the shark as soon as the teacher did it. Um, all right, let's see. What else do we got? Oh, look at Sophia's the, the light bulb in the book. Benjamin Simpson with the star face. Oh, that's so cool. How do I get rid of this keyboard? <laughs> No, 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 I'm good. Oh, I love the kit, kit, the cat with the heart face and the waves. Super smiley face, teethy grin. Shout out to York girl. I'm so glad you're here. Now, one of the debates we had, uh, we got into a very heated discussion during our dinner this evening among the whole TEDx team. Um, and it regarded ranch. And I'm a big fan of ranch. I think, uh, you know, Pizza crust is simply a vehicle for ranch. Um, but uh, but then I said I thought Hidden Valley Ranch was garbage, and I think I almost got attacked. There's a lot of uh, Hidden Va Valley Ranch connoisseurs out there. I think they're a little pedestrian, if you ask me. But um, but uh, what, what, what's, what's your favorite ranch? I, I make my own ranch. That's how I roll. Oh, I will do Hidden Valley in a pinch, you know. If it's a ranch emergency, I'll uh, I'll go with the Hidden Valley. Scott Johnson's thinking about it. Scott Johnson, class of 02, just like me, represent Mike Gonzalez. Going for a bike. Angela Burks at Garland Ranch. Oh, yeah, that's a good ranch. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'll hook you up with the uh, recipe, <laughs> Heather. Um, it's legit, although I think your daughter has a killer ranch recipe as well, and I think it's very similar to mine. Yeah, Scott Johnson, class of 02. Miss Williston, also class of 02. Represent, I think it's the three of us. Oh, and I didn't get to, um, is Jordana here yet? I hope she gets a chance to come up here. You're going to see Jordana Rock, Rock. She was one of my first students. Um, and I got to tell you a little story about Jordana. Um, she, uh, when, after my first year, so Scott Johnson and Kande and I started in 02, uh, the next year, the athletic director at the time said, Kevin, I want you to co coach softball. And I was like, I've never coached softball before. He's like, yeah, but you, you like baseball, don't you? And I was like, yeah. He said, it's the same thing. Just go for it. So I coached softball for, for uh, the year, the season of 03, and Jordana Rock was the catcher. Um, and she was so nice to me because she knew a million times more about softball than me and uh, was really cool about it the whole time. But she had a bullet from, from home plate to, uh, to second base. Um, and uh, and I, I didn't coach softball the next year for some reason. Not sure why. Um, let's see. Who, we got, who else do we got? Uh, Denise. Uh, oh, shout out to Gio from Australia. Uh, that's the uh, Breast Cancer Rehabilitation Channel. Um, so glad you're here to support Gio. She rocks. We're so glad to have her back here at York School. Uh, there's June. June likes Hidden Valley Ranch tumbler container to drink. Oh yeah, I've seen that on on the uh, on the meat calls. Sometimes you're drinking your shake out of the Hidden Valley Ranch tumbler. <laughs> John Zeljo found the the fluorescent yellow softball. Nice work. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, JD. The catcher is the one who sits behind a plate, and uh, the catcher is always the like toughest one, the one who can. Uh, can take anything. Absolutely, Jordana Rush. Professor Zorro is John Daniel, our very own. Yep, that's right. Okay, who wants to go next? Anyone want to take the stage? 
Where's the rest of our crew? Okay, great. Fred makes oh, does he makes blue cheese? All right, we're gonna we're gonna swap uh, cream based salad dressing someday, Aaron. I want to check this out. Um, again, I just want to uh, to thank you all for for being here. Yeah, you want to take it over, Francis? Come on down. I thought catcher. I thought catcher kicked the puck in the three pointer. <laughs> Aiden spoken like a true mountain biker. Um, yeah, someday when we can share food again, we'll have a salad fiesta day. That sounds amazing. All right, Francis, your next tech tech officer. Yes, I am your new tech officer. Hi. Um. And yes, we should have a salad fiesta sometime. That sounds like a great, uh, a great idea. <laughs> Tell us about fresh ranch. I have a lot of opinions about ranch dressing. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not happening, Mr. Daniel, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, no, ranch dressing. You don't want it to be too thick. You don't want it, it, it to be too light because you don't want it to feel like you're, you're eating water and you don't want it to feel like you're eating a bunch of mayo so you got to kind of find a balance <laughs> i could go on all day so please somebody comment something else so we don't end up having a too long conversation about ranch what's everybody's favorite restaurant in the area or favorite covid at, at hobby i think we all picked up weird little hobbies oh there's wesley cordier my fellow new tech officer so hello to him yeah <laughs> Uh, you used to watch as a kid where they made you scared of nuclear war. Oh, yeah. I recently rediscovered this weird show I watched as a child. It was this, like, German show that was dubbed into English. And it would always, like, teach, teach us about something. And in the end, it would, like, be, like, showing a disaster scenario every episode. And some of these were seared into my brain to the point where even today I still am scared of them. Uh, talk about Knitting Club. Knitting Club, it is a small club at York. Mr. Brookhauser recently became our uh, new faculty advisor because our formal faculty advisor is on medical leave and we're doing a lot of really awesome projects. Um, <laughs> let's see, what's everybody's favorite new COVID hobby? I think we all picked up weird little hobbies, interests, um, and for those, you're one of the coolest <laughs> where besides your house you sh should one go for Italian on the peninsula um well we don't go go to Italian restaurants a lot because my dad's opinion on it is I can make Italian food at home but a good place for that is um Rosine's on uh Alvarado Street I believe uh Giordata uh York alumni and one of our distinguished speakers is going to take over for me now. All right. So I was sitting backstage, um, of course, powdering my nose, and I heard that somebody wrote my name on the chat. So am I supposed to be looking here? Okay. I see what's going on. Uh, so shout out to anybody joining from Australia. I think maybe Denise. Oh, Miss Keist, I can't even say Kim Keist, like the, that's just ingrained in me. Miss Torg and Miss Durkey, hello. <laughs> this is, oh, Tim Durkey? Oh my God, that is a throwback, man. Oh, and Mrs. Durkey. Oh, hello, all the, all the Durkeys. And Mr. Johnson, hello everyone, this is great. <laughs> Good I mates. Okay, so yeah, Australia, and I think we had some people from, uh, I don't know, other places in the world. Um, there are some really great conversations and presentations and talks tonight that I'm really looking forward to personally. I read them and I actually had to hold back tears. So um, definitely stay the whole time. Um, there are some really good ones throughout the whole night. These York kids, I have to say, now I'm like, geez, how did I get into this school? These people are just amazing. Such great talent, and I'm really excited to be on the stage with them. Uh, baking after Heather cleans up. Well, that is so lovely. Is Juliet Oliver? Hey, 
I think that's Mrs. Oliver who provided some amazing pizza earlier. So big shout out to Mrs. Oliver. <laughs> Woo! Yes. All right. Oh, Miss Torg, how's my little newbie? Well, I mean, am I allowed to talk about my baby? Okay. I mean, it's like the only thing I have a lot of information on right now, but he's nine weeks old and really amazing and asleep. And my husband is incredible. And in the audience, my brother's in the audience too. Hello. <laughs> um, so you may know my last name is Rock and my husband's last name is Stuart. And he actually, we came to the table. We're like, what's his name going to be? Oscar is his first name, which is pretty great. And then, um, this is such a filler, but I mean, if you don't know me, you're like, who cares, but please hold on. There's a clincher. So, um, Reese came to the table and he's like, yeah, it has to be last name rock. Like that is such a cool last name. And I was like, what? No way. You're the husband, you know, like your last name's Stuart. It has to be Stuart. Um, but, uh, his name is Oscar Stewart rock. So if there are any Jewish people in the audience, there's actually a really fun song we sing at Passover called Dayenu. And it has like one word, Dayenu, over and over. But anyway, we made that into a song. Oscar, 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 Stewart, 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 Rock. Oscar, Stewart, Stewart, Rock, Oscar, Rock. <laughs> so, and now, <laughs> dinner and a show. I think we're just at time now. So um, somebody did tell me, just talk. I'm like, just be careful what you wish for. Um, what time is it? Oh my goodness. I think it's time for us to grace the stage with Miss Q. Thank you. Well, even though that amount of time felt like a short amount of time, surprisingly, it was already half an hour. So half an hour has come and gone, you know. So hopefully all of you people at home have gotten comfy and stuff. And for all the people who are all of the people, I guess all of the family members who have joined us here, you're getting comfy. So it's about that time. I was going to say five minutes, but actually we now only have three minutes. So you have three minutes to stretch, uh, get a snack or a beverage, make yourself feel comfy. And I want to encourage you to keep participating in the chat during the event. It does not disturb the speakers at all. It makes them feel very loved because they're reading it backstage. So keep putting your commentary in the comments. Um, we will be reading through them, not verbally, of course, but uh, we, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I will see you back on the stage in a, a few minutes.
All right, this is the official welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to give you a shout out to the people in the audience. It's a, it's a really small audience this year. It is the close family members of our speakers tonight. Thank you for sharing your time with us and, and sharing your, uh, your, your talented family member with us. Uh, we're really excited for this evening. Um, my name is Kevin Brookhauser. I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation here. Uh, we've been, uh, Ms. Q, Grace, and I have been uh, putting this on for over six years. And this year, we weren't sure we were going to pull this off. But uh, the students here at York School who helped keep this culture alive inspired us to figure out a way to make this happen. And we're so excited uh, that the students here and the students in this room are here to make this happen in this, this great community. Uh, I'm here to introduce my co-organizer of this event, Grace Q. Thank you. <laughs> So hopefully you're not tired of hearing my voice. Um, don't worry, it will be over soon. Uh, so I just wanted to give a special shout out to uh, the student speakers and the community members and, um, the, and basically anyone who wrote a talk because having given a talk during the first TEDx, it's a lot of work. You go through a lot of emotional energy to write those talks, memorize them, and to finally deliver them to the people who mean the most to you. And so I think that's what makes tonight so special is just being able to take something that is so meaningful to you and then share it to everyone. Um, so there was a lot of time and dedication in that. Also shout out to the tech team. Without the tech team, we, there would be no TEDx. Like there, we would not be here. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like the people at home, you wouldn't even be seeing this. So um, great. Like, I'm just so grateful for the tech team. Um, and then for the families who were able to show up to um, the live studio uh, performance here, um, thank you for um, really investing in your family member's life and being able to show up and support because without you, truly, like this event would not be possible. So thank you so much for being here. And finally, thank you at home for watching us on the live stream. You are what make this event happen tonight because uh, you're our audience tonight in addition to the group in the room. I can't imagine this year without our MC this evening. Uh, our student body vice president, Kevin Deleary, really showed amazing leadership. If you attended any of our breaks this year, watch them online or on Meet or whatever, you know how he held this community together in this crazy year that we've just had. Uh, please give a warm round of applause for our MC, Kevin Deleary. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight for the sixth TEDx York School event. Now, before we get into our six lovely speakers of the night, I'd actually love to offer some thought of my own. The elephant in the room brings up difficult conversations. Sometimes we need to have these conversations. Not only is this idiom the theme for tonight's event, but it's been the theme for the past 15 months. Distance learning, six feet apart, quarantining. Although this past year has completely dismantled what we knew as normality, it's important to talk about the ways in which we came together to put those pieces back. Finding ways to continue learning, finding ways to stay active, finding ways to be together. Without each and every one of you doing your part, in slowing the spread of COVID-19, there is no event that happens tonight. And that is something worth talking about. Now that's enough of me. I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the night. Our first speaker of the night has, has always had an interest in wildlife. In high school, he found a platform where he could express his love for mother nature. Teen conservation leaders at the Monterey Bay Aquarium not only allowed him to flourish as a biologist, but paved the way for him to connect with different people from all walks of life. Here to share their wisdom and many, many stories is Seth Madden. Well, 
One thing that my friends say about me is that I can't stop talking about the ocean. I completely agree. I have a random assortment of facts in my brain, and I seem to be able to recall them randomly, and I almost always have to share. For example, I think it's so cool how different clans of orcas can have different languages, and different orcas within that clan can have different accents. One of the biggest reasons for my love of the ocean is the Teen Conservation Leaders Program that I became a part of in the summer of 2017. TCL is a program at the Monterey Bay Aquarium for high schoolers in which they're given the opportunity to volunteer there. We start off the summer with a two-week training where we meet the staff and volunteer mentors we will be working with, as well as the new TCL students and returning TCL student coaches that will be our partners in crime for the summer. During the summer, we're partnered with an adult guide, and after that, we're able to volunteer in many different positions around the aquarium. And I said in my bio that I'm almost always busy with something, and that's because I decided to apply for as many positions as possible. I held tubes of jellies, learned about exhibit design, made props for the education programs, and was even invited to represent teen programs at the grand opening of the new education building, where I spoke with donors and even Julie Packard herself. Uh, where I spoke with donors and even Julie Packard herself. Um, while I've done a lot behind the scenes, most of my experience was on the floor interacting with guests. Guests come from all over the world. I've spoken with people who come from the middle of the United States who have never seen the ocean before. People who flew all the way from Norway to visit the aquarium, locals visiting for the 351st time, and many, many others. And, of course, how can I resist telling you about a few of those experiences? One of them was fairly early on in my volunteer career. I was out on the back deck with another TCL student handing up binoculars for people to look out across Monterey Bay. We began talking with this one guest who said that although she'd been to the aquarium before, she never got to fully enjoy it because she'd been babysitting. We had a great conversation, and while I don't remember many of the details, I remember her asking, if we enjoy being volunteers? And I said, yes. And talking to guests like you makes the experience so much better. And after that small connection, we ended the conversation smiling. Another memorable experience was at the end of the day. I wanted to get better at greeting guests without having some deeper conversation to go into. So I decided to stand by the door with a staff member at the end of the day instead of leaving. I was a little nervous and felt awkward at first, but I got the opportunity to talk with the staff member. She was fairly new, but she'd worked in hospitality before, which is why she was so good at saying goodbye to guests as they left. And I got more comfortable with it too, and left feeling accomplished. And the greatest thing is, a few months later, when I walk into the guide lounge to start my Sunday morning shift, I discover that she's a new volunteer on the same shift. Since then, while we were still in person, I would talk with her before the shift began and after when we're packing up our things and signing out. While I have many, many other experiences I could share, I also have a time limit, so I'm going to move on. I think that one of the biggest takeaways from my experience in TCL is the connections I've made. I became close friends with many of the people in the program. When I started, I knew only a few people, but by the end of the two-week training, and definitely by the end of the summer, I was practically best friends with everyone in my group. I'm still in contact with quite a few of them today. We've organized get-togethers where we've ate food and played Spicy Uno, which I think is by far the best version of Uno that I've ever played. Spicy Uno is basically regular Uno, but with a few added rules to make it more interesting, such as being able to offer cards to people or getting a card for every single word you say when a four is played. We always had a lot of fun playing Spicy Uno, especially when we were supposed to be quiet because the four is played, even though we were rarely ever quiet. I still see them around the aquarium continuing to volunteer or just visiting. I even invited one of them to my orchestra concert and attended her high school graduation party. I also became friends with a lot of the adult volunteers and mentors. 
Since it's such a small world, I will see them around town and we'll wave at each other and are smiling the entire time. However, the connections I made during my time in TCL don't necessarily need to last for a long time, but can last only for a few minutes. As I said, I've talked to guests from all over the world. Most of my interactions with guests focus on the exhibits. They're amazed by the swaying kelp with various fish swimming around, the massive sardines changing shape every second, and of course, the sharks calmly swimming by the glass. Some people like to go more into the science, learning about how the California sheephead transitions from female to male, or how jellies mass reproduce through polyps. One notable experience I remember was with a mother and daughter in front of the kelp forest. I caught their attention with the sheephead. I talked about how all sheephead are born female, and eventually the most dominant female in an area will become a male. The kelp forest exhibit has a few females, but only one male, because females won't transition if there's a male present. Once I finished talking about the sheephead, I continued to talk about the kelp forest. I answered their questions and shared more cool facts about the exhibit in front of them. I felt crushed when I had to move to my next station, which was on the other side of the aquarium. While this conversation only made it to the exhibit, some conversations make it to the final message of conservation, where we talk about climate change, plastic pollution, and overfishing. But no matter which stage the conversation makes it to, the, most, uh, the best conversations are the one where you form some form of connection. Connections can be formed over many different things. This past summer, I participated in an online program with the aquarium where we learned about the best ways to get a message out to the public through social media. We talked about six different mindsets that can be used to help people connect over the ocean. All senses, laws and policies, family traditions, amazing wildlife, God's beautiful creation, and feeling at peace. I personally connect with the all senses, amazing wildlife, and feeling at peace mindsets, and through those have been able to connect with other people. I think that the most important thing I learned during my experience in TCL is to be open to making new connections. Making new connections can be hard. You have to be able to step out of your comfort zone, which can be difficult at first. When I started as a volunteer, I was really nervous. I avoided conversations that talked about climate change and just focused on the exhibits in front of me. But through the summer, I got more comfortable with those topics. And as I continue to volunteer, my conversations have gotten deeper. One example of this was in front of the open sea exhibit. I was holding a tube of jellies, and there was another TCL student next to me with another tube. Two guests walked up to us to ask what was in the tubes. Keep in mind that the area we're in is really dark, so it's hard to see inside. Since they just walked past a bunch of jellies, they guessed that there was jellies in the tubes. That's when we turned on our red lights to show them what was really inside. The tube I was holding had jellies, but the other tube had small circles of plastic. The guests were surprised at the resemblance between the two. We finished the conversation by talking about plastic pollution and ways we can help such as using reusable bottles, straws, and bags. And I think that the funniest part of this interaction was that one of the guests was holding a plastic bottle. But I like to think that after this, she went to get a reusable one. Whether it's a conversation about how cute the penguins are, sharing the Seattle recovery story, or talking about the imminent threat of climate change that can lead to the extinction of many species around the world, we forget our differences and focus on what we have in common. Even if I don't say a single thing about large issues like climate change and just talk about how adorable the penguins are, I can go home knowing that I made a difference in someone's day and that they will remember our interaction for years to come. So remember, for all of us, making even the smallest connections over experience and passions, especially after a year of being disconnected, is a great way to make a difference in someone's life and to make a difference in those large issues we care so much about. Thank you.
tonight, we have the honors of hearing from a 2006 York graduate. Even though she had never been involved in the world of technology before her junior year of college, her journey from being a receptionist to senior manager at the sixth biggest software company in the world has allowed her to find her voice and inspired her to help others find their own. Here to give their talk is Jordana Rock. I am a fraud. I have somehow conned my way through the back door into the tech industry. I don't have a computer science degree. I don't know how to code. And here I am in 2011, the first woman hired in IT in the 30 years of existence of this tech company. Let me back up. It's 2011 and I moved to Australia following a guy I met while studying abroad. Spoil alert. Becomes my husband later. <laughs> and I move over with no money, no friends, and definitely no job opportunities. So I apply for any and all jobs out in the market. The first company that calls me back, actually the only people that call me back, is a temp agency to see if I want to be a receptionist for one day. Now, at the time, I was living in a black hole of cell reception, so I precariously put my phone on the windowsill just to get any kind of phone calls. I got this call in the morning, and I felt like I had won the lottery. I was going to be employed <laughs> for one day. So my boyfriend jumped out of bed, started ironing my clothes, and I took a shower. I showed up at this company as one of four receptionists. That's how big this tech company was. And I realized I was being called in because they were rolling out Google Apps. Yes, Gmail, Google Drive, and Google Docs. That's all there was then. And they had hired a consultancy to do some professional training. I had just been using Google Apps in college for the previous year, and I didn't need any training. So I turned to the other three receptionists, and I taught them how to use shared calendars and how to book a, a room. And while I was doing this, a consultant ended up walking by and realized that I, I've been sharing some tips and tricks. That was the first time I encountered a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody who advocates for you when you're not in the room. This person ended up going to the IT manager and said, you know, you're going to need ongoing training. So why don't you hire this woman as a change manager just for six months? Give her a go, as the Australians say. So all of a sudden, I found myself in IT. <laughs> in those six months, though, I taught myself Camtasia, a video editing tool. I ran webinars every week. I wrote FAQs and published blog posts on new tips and tricks. And I also was invited behind the big wall that separated the CEO's office from every other employee. Oh, I showed up to that wall and I thought, what am I doing? Like, how am I going to teach a CEO anything? I walk behind that wall and I sit shoulder to shoulder to this market well-known, very intimidating CEO and taught him how to use Gmail. <laughs> My great work there ended up referring me into another job where this company was rolling out a product called Salesforce. As mentioned before, uh, it's the sixth biggest software company in the world and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> It's a CRM software, well, no software, in the cloud. But I didn't know what a CRM was either, a contact relationship management tool. I told this person in the interview, I'm not going to lie to you, I don't know what this is. But what I can tell you is, my first year out of college, I had six jobs. I taught myself Camtasia. I helped my newspaper back in Monterey roll out Google Apps. If I want something, I will figure it out promise you, I will work hard and I can learn quickly. And he said, okay, let's try it out. That was Friday morning over breakfast. And by Monday, I was flying down to Sydney for a training program to become a system admin of Salesforce. I ended up rolling out Salesforce for this company with the help of my IT manager. And um, the, the thing was, 
I ended up progressing in that company to become the manager myself. But I had my sights set on something bigger, the world. So I then moved into consulting, and over the next four years, I ended up implementing successful projects across the world, in Hong Kong, in New York, in Australia. I felt like the luckiest person in the world. Luck certainly had something to do with it. You know, I was there at the right place at the right time, at the right reception desk. But, uh, but luck was not the only ingredient for success. You know, I had my sponsors. And I also had my work that really spoke to my, what I was capable of. Yet I had not really found my own voice yet until I was forced to. Jamila Rizvi writes in her book, Not Just Lucky, that women in the workplace are expected to be polite, and um, our best asset is to be likable. But if we advocate for ourselves, sometimes we may be seen as pushy or aggressive, or worst of all, ambitious. <laughs> but I was in a different world. We needed to advocate for ourselves. I was on a project, a really big project, and I was leading a big portion of the implementation. And a male colleague of mine ended up writing up a success story about this project, neglecting to mention a couple of people's names, including yours truly. And I thought, man, I am chipped. What? I thought my work would speak for itself. Unfortunately, I saw this male colleague of mine get promoted twice in the time period that I was promoted zero times. And I said, man, that's never going to happen again. I have got to be my own advocate. I have to voice how great my work is. And I got that opportunity. I was offered, um, I was actually in, invited to apply for a role at the mothership, Salesforce itself. As a solution engineer, my dream job. This is a technical resource, a very vital uh, expert in the whole sales process. I had eight interviews and was flown down to Sydney for a panel presentation. And by the time I flew back to Brisbane, I landed on the tarmac and I got that phone call from recruitment. I got the job. Oh my God, this was amazing. I could not believe it. I showed up at the building in Sydney, the Salesforce building. And again, that voice in my head, I am a fraud. They're going to find me out. I had six certifications. I had implemented successful projects all across the world, and yet still, I didn't know how successful I, I could be. I didn't know how much I needed to believe in myself. I was shadowing a colleague of mine after a presentation, and I was telling him about this imposter syndrome I was really dealing with. And he said, you know, you do actually have something that a lot of us don't. You've been a customer. You've implemented projects. You've led them from end to end. You know, that's, and all of that without a tech background, you taught that yourself. You learned that yourself. And so I thought, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should share this story a bit. <laughs> you know, if this does help a receptionist somewhere else or somebody in another position that thinks, um, you know, the, the possibilities are uh, limited, then my story is worth sharing. So I wrote a blog post on LinkedIn and that blog post got pretty popular. It actually caught the eye of a vice president of Asia Pacific. And he ended up sending this article to the co-founders of Salesforce, Mark Benioff and Parker Harris. And one of them wrote back, Parker Harris emailed me saying, hi, Jordan, it's so great to hear your story. If you're ever in San Francisco, let me know. I ended up getting invited in the green room behind stage at our biggest conference of the year, Dreamforce. 180,000 people pre-COVID would come to San Francisco. And um, this presenter, uh, Parker Harris, the co-founder, was presenting at one of the keynotes. And I got to ask him, what do you see in good leadership? And how can I strive to be a leader in my own right? And what I ended up walking away with was how humble and how approachable a leader really can be. 
Now, I am eternally grateful for my sponsors, for uh, my work, and for finding my own voice. But now I am a senior manager myself. My, uh, my view on diversity actually evolved through my career. Before I became a manager, we were all obsessed with this book by Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In. She talks about women having a seat at the table. And it somehow got ingrained in our heads that there was only one seat of diversity at the table, one seat for a woman. And unfortunately, it ended up feeling like all of us were vying for that one seat and it was very competitive. It was so competitive that I ended up having to take time off work. And like a true millennial, I ended up going to a yoga retreat. I took a step back and I thought, it's not about the table. It's not about the seat. It's actually about the voices in the room. Who are we listening to? Who are we turning to for advice? Now that I am a leader, I am so privileged and honored to be able to lead this team and pave the way for leaders to come. Not only do I get to be a sponsor or a voice in the room for others, but I also get to invite those other perspectives and voices in the room as well. More recently, I had uh, an employee in my team get invited to lead one of the biggest deals that we had all year. I knew that she had all the experience and, and really capable to lead this. Behind the scenes, you know, we were uh, strategizing. I was her coach and confidant. But at the end of the day, she owned her own voice in the room. A team of 20 plus people were turning to her saying, what should we do next? And I loved it when our executives would turn, not to me as a leader or not our VP, but to her and say, what do you think we should do next? That for me is giving me chills just thinking about it. That is a successful um, leadership role that I can play. I can open the door of opportunity for them. So yes, I am absolutely it's table stakes to be a sponsor and advocate for those people who are talented. But I now strive as a leader to not only be in the room, but to pull out a chair for the voices who don't even know they need to be heard. Thank you. From attending UCLA and USC to serving his country for four years in the Navy, our next speaker really has done it all. After being a medical director for six years, he founded and became the CEO of Light Speed Testing, which has brought rapid testing to the Monterey County. Here to give you more is Dr. Samir Bakta. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks very much for having me. I'm really excited to speak today. All right, I'm going to start by talking about Super Bowl 27, January 31st, 1993. The Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Dallas Cowboys versus the Buffalo Bills. The Bills were about to carry on the grand tradition of the AFC in the 1990s and lose ignominiously for their third straight Super Bowl in a row. Dallas, on the other hand, was about to win their first of three Super Bowls in four years. In the fourth quarter, with the game well in hand, Leon Lett, a Dallas defensive end, picks up a fumble and starts scampering towards the end zone. He's a defensive end, maybe not so much scampering. I think Chris Berman used to call it rumbling, bumbling, and stumbling on his way. In any case, he's on his way to the end zone, and he looks up because he can see the Jumbotron up ahead and decides that now is the time for his Sports Center moment. He's on the 10-yard line. He's 30 feet away from the end zone. This is his moment of football glory. But Leon reaches out his hand, does, the, uh, does the, the, the pose to get ready, 
to uh, win the game, or at least to win his touchdown, and get himself on the Sports Center highlight reel. But little did he know that right behind him was Don Beebe, the Buffalo wide receiver who chased him down, took the ball out of his hands before Leon could cross the end zone. His little showboat act meant that Don Beebe could turn Leon Lett's moment of glory into the most infamous Super Bowl gaffe of all time. And really, this is where we are right now. Um, we're 10 feet away, and what we don't want to do is end up like Leon Lett and fumble the ball at the last second. Um, we can see the end of the pandemic in sight. We're so close. How do we make sure that we get this done and we don't make the mistake like that? Let's look at India. Um, even as recently as a month or two ago, India was being praised for its, uh, its efforts against COVID-19. They were starting the vaccine rollout. Their health minister even said, this is the end game of the pandemic. Well, we've unfortunately seen what's happened since then. This is the Kumbh Mela, which is a religious festival. 3.5 million people on the banks of the Ganges River, most of them without masks and none of them with any sort of social distancing. Um, of course, you can guess what happened next at the super spreader event to end all super spreader events. Combine that with political rallies and a general loosening of restrictions, and India is now the poster child for what not to do. They are now leading the world in COVID deaths and cases and misery. Um, COVID's pretty wicked. Uh, if you don't, if you lose your focus, if you don't keep your eye on the ball, it will take you out from behind and fumble. So how do we make sure we don't fumble the ball at the five yard line? So ultimately, the answer to COVID is vaccination. That's the key to ending this pandemic. And the problem is, is that we're not quite there yet. And misinformation, <coughs> politicization of public health and vaccine hesitancy is going to hamper what we've already done, the, the great job we've already done with this vaccine rollout. But in the meantime, we can't really wait for the entire world to be vaccinated before we get ourselves back to business. The effect of the COVID uh, lockdowns and the restrictions have been devastating on our schools, our school children, our small businesses, our restaurants. And so the question is, how do we get back to reopening? What do we need to do to get back to normal until we get to full vaccination and herd immunity? Because really, until the entire world is vaccinated, we're all still a little vulnerable or maybe a lot vulnerable. Um, and the question is, is, is there, is there some sort of a middle solution that bridges the gap between the sharp bl or the blunt acts of a lockdown and this laissez-faire attitude of, well, we'll just reopen the economy. Everything will be fine. No problem. The virus will just disappear like a miracle. The answer is there is that solution. There is that middle ground. And the solution is something we've been doing for a while. It's called testing. So the problem with testing is testing has been the original sin of this pandemic, at least how we've been managing it in America. From the CDC's bungled rollout of the initial tests to those long testing lines that we all saw on TV or had to sit through, the way that we've approached testing could be filed under a heading of how not to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's been a problem from the beginning. The difference is now, all of a sudden, we now have something new on the horizon. Rapid antigen tests, which are easy, fast, cheap, and simple to do that can actually give us actionable intelligence to make a real difference. These tests are so easy, even a school kid can do it. That's my son, who is my unwitting model. Um, and these are easy to do. And the thing about these is that this lets us go on the offense. It lets us be proactive against COVID instead of reactive. And it lets us isolate, find those people who are sick and get them into isolation before they can infect others. Let's talk a few minutes about tests because there's a lot of confusion between the two different types and what's, what kind of test do you need. So the big ones that we talk about are PCR and antigen testing. And so the way I like to describe this is that if you're a detective and you're trying to find a bad guy out in the community, so you can take your, the fingerprint of the bad guy and you can go around and try and match it to every single person's fingerprint out there. It, it's doable, you, it works, but boy, it takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of machines, takes a lot of resources. It's not a very efficient way of trying to screen a large population to try and find your bad guy out there. But maybe there's another way. If you remember the old be on the lookout alerts, right? Wanted posters, descriptions. You say, okay, well, maybe we're not going to look for somebody's fingerprint, but instead we're going to look for somebody wearing, I don't know, a red Hawaiian shirt and jeans, you know, maybe like this guy. So instead of that, you're saying, okay, we're going to go out and try and find somebody wearing a red Hawaiian shirt and blue jeans. Um, now, the problem is, of course, the virus is a little wily, 
And this bad guy that we're looking for, you know, might change his image, might change his hair, might change his glasses. Um, but for the most part, we can figure that out. The other problem, of course, is if some unwitting soul decides, hmm, today's a really good day to go out and wear my red Hawaiian shirt and blue jeans. And unfortunately, you end up picking up this guy uh, instead of your target, and he gets picked up in the dragnet by accident. But for the most part, that kind of approach, this kind of uh, more, more effective screening tool, is really useful and something that's much better at looking at and trying to find infected folks in the middle of a pandemic. And this is rapid antigen testing. This is an easy, simple way that we can use this to screen large populations of individuals. And the best part is, is that it's easy to do and it's low cost. Um, so it gives us that whole thing that we talked about at the car shop, right? Good, fast, and cheap. Pick two. You can get to three with this guy, which is kind of nice. So one of the things about rapid antigen testing is, is that it gives you the chance to identify people um, before they're sick because they, ha they ha don't have symptoms yet. There's a study right up the street at UCSF that said that these antigen tests were 98.5% sensitive at picking up contagious individuals and 99.9% .9 at uh, the specific at ruling out the ones that weren't actually sick. Um, these tests can pick up folks who are contagious but yet asymptomatic. And that's really the key because asymptomatic spread, the spread of the virus before you get symptoms, this is the hallmark of COVID-19. This is the absolute key as why this pandemic has been so bad. In previous viruses like SARS, people weren't contagious until they started having symptoms. It was relatively easy to sit here and say, oh, I've got symptoms, I need to go home and isolate, no problem. But with COVID, you get sick after you start spreading it to other people. So I'll give you an example. You could go and say, I'm gonna go see grandma this weekend. You go out and you get tested on Wednesday, your test results come back on Friday and they're negative. Great, I go see grandma on Saturday, all as well. Well, guess what? Now, on Monday, I start getting sick. I start getting symptoms. And the problem was, I started expressing viral load on Friday after I took my test, but I didn't have any symptoms. I exposed grandma on Saturday, and now I'm sick on Monday with the sniffle. Grandma's in the ICU. This is what's happening with COVID, and this is why this virus is so hard to, is hard to beat. And the problem is we've been using a lot of tools that really haven't worked very well. We've all seen this at the, uh, at the, the Apple store or anywhere else you go where somebody wants to take your temperature. Um, worthless. Most folks in COVID may develop a fever, but they're not going to do it until several days into the course of their illness. So checking somebody for asymptomatic spread of COVID with a fever scanner doesn't work. You can ask questions. Yeah, maybe that might help a little bit. But for the most part, they're about as valuable as those TSA questions we all have to use to answer. Remember, did you pack this bag, sir? Did anybody give you anything to put in this bag? Of course, no real terrorist is going to ask the answer yes to those questions. It's not a very useful tool. Same kind of thing. What we really need is an actual tool with real results that actually can reliably let us find out people who are infected, um, who are contagious, and get them out of circulation before they can pass this virus on to other people. And what we're doing, again, really hasn't been working. We've been making people stand in these long lines. We've been telling them that you need to get the stick shoved all the way up your nose to the back of your throat and, you know, an inch away from your brain. And we're saying, and you're not going to get results for two or three days. Well, no wonder people aren't jumping through these hoops. Nobody's going to go and do this unless you have symptoms and you want to know if you have COVID. But the problem is that's not the folks we need to test. We need to test people before they have symptoms. This is where rapid antigen testing comes in. Um, what we should be doing is we should be getting these tests out all over the place. Everybody should have them in their home. People should take them every day. Um, and they're actually starting to do this in places like Colorado and North Carolina, uh, where they're sending tests to people at home, or you can pick up new request tests from Colorado. They're starting to get to the point where they're cheaper, but they're still a little bit on the expensive side. Hopefully, we'll get to that point soon. But the other thing that we can do is we can start having verified screening programs at important places where people could transmit the virus, places like your workplace or um, sporting events or youth sports or, um, uh, excuse me, um, or youth sports or sporting events or just events in general. These are all places that we can put together screening programs and say, let's screen people before they have the chance to infect other people. So the interesting thing about, uh, about kids is that we used to think that schools are going to be these super spreading hotspots and that we were going to have to close schools and do all this stuff with schools. What we're finding is that schools themselves may not really be the hotspots we were worried about. But youth sports, on the other hand, 
may very well be, and a lot of it is that these kids are, may not actually be getting the virus at school, but they're getting them in the after school sports um, when they're out playing baseball or football or what have you. Um, it might be that they're doing this unmasked, they're doing it in close proximity, but instead of just hoping that kids don't get sick or testing them once a week and then having them play a game six days later when in the interim they might get infected, what if we did a rapid antigen test for every athlete right before they play their games? We can screen them immediately and we know if they're, they're shedding virus and say, hey, you know what, you're you test positive, you can't play, and save all those other kids out there from getting infected. Uh, workplaces are starting to become an area of tension as well. We're seeing folks who are vaccinated and folks who are unvaccinated pretty nervous about mingling with each other and, and going back to the workplace. What if we said we're going to set up screening programs where employees can get tested before they go to work? And that way we know for a fact whether you're sick or not, whether you're contagious or not, and we can get people back into the workplace safely. And in Monterey County, and all the other counties as well, but especially ours, and especially here on the peninsula, Events are the lifeblood of our economy. Whether it's conferences or conventions, parties or car week, uh, events are what drive our community uh, and what keep us going. And so what if we said we're gonna screen every attendee to any one of these events? We're gonna say you gotta get tested before you come in. Uh, what if we screened everybody at the airport when they arrived? Alaska's doing this and it's working really well for them. And say, everybody gets, some, before you come into Monterey, you gotta get screened at the airport and then you're not bringing this virus into our community. This can let us reopen our events safely. So the other thing people talk about is vaccinations and using that, but how do we know that somebody's really vaccinated? Um, vaccine passports have already become this huge hot button issue. Um, and we've had seen a, a relentless politicization over that and over testing and positivity rates. Um, how can we be sure that somebody's vaccine card that they're showing us really proves that they're vaccinated when they can buy this stuff on eBay? But what if we said we're going to combine vaccination with a quick antigen test so that you're going to an event and you say, okay, great, you need to be vaccinated and we're going to do a quick antigen test. That way, just in case somebody slipped through the cracks on vaccination, you've got a, a verified antigen test that they've done before they walk in and you know for a fact that everybody coming into that event is clear. And then you could have things like COVID-free zones. You could have a COVID-free event. And maybe we might be able to loosen up on some of the masking and social distancing restrictions. And I don't know, be able to go to a bar? It'd be kind of nice. Um, so these are a lot of different things we can think about doing. I fully believe that using rapid antigen testing in conjunction with other things is the way out of this pandemic. Um, this is an adjunct to what we're already doing, but it really gives us the chance to be proactive, to go on offense against this virus and say, we are going to find people who are infected before they have symptoms. We're going to find them. We're going to isolate them. We're going to get them out of circulation. We're going to stop the spread of this disease. So in order to bring this to Monterey County, a colleague and I created a startup that we're calling Lightspeed Testing. And the goal of Lightspeed Testing is to bring rapid antigen testing at high volume, at high scale, anywhere it's needed on the peninsula or in the county at large, whether it's events or sporting events or sports or youth sports or workplaces, anywhere that needs this, we can bring this to them. We're using things like um, the Toyota production model and lean production techniques to try and minimize the amount of resources that we're using. And so we can get people screened relatively quickly with a minimum amount of footprint and a minimum amount of resources. Um, and the best part is, is that because of new federal regulations, this testing has to be covered by insurance. So it means that these, we can do these tests at no cost to individuals and no cost to businesses because the insurance carriers have to carry it and the government will pick up the tab even if you're uninsured. So this is really exciting and we're really hoping to, to roll this out at large. The other thing that's really helpful about the, the, what we're doing is that because we're a local business and we have local ties to our local community and our local medical community, it means that we can bring people in to get the, the extra resources and the extra therapies that they need if they do come up positive. One of the things that I've been doing as an emergency physician is we've been giving antibody therapy, monoclonal antibodies. Um, the problem is, is that they need to be given within the first few days of infection. Usually by the time we see somebody, they've had symptoms, they thought about it, then they've gone to get tested, and then three days later they get the result that they're positive. And finally, by the time they come to see me for their antibody infusion, they're already 10 days in, it's too late. If we can get people tested early, we have the connections to be able to get people into those therapies right away, even the next day. 
Um, this is the advantage of being a local business with local ties to our community. So rapid antigen testing isn't always the, it's not the be all and end all, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. And it gives us the ability to get our economy back going. It lets us reopen our economy, it lets us reboot our businesses, and to let us restart our events safely. I fully believe this is one of the ways that we can get out of this. Um, and to quote another traveler through strange and difficult times, this is the way. Thank you. The music that you've been hearing all night is actually none other than our next speaker. As the musical component of this event, he will be explain, or exploring his own complex history with music, how frequencies have allowed him to perceive the world in a more positive manner, and how percussion can be applied to anyone's life. Please give a warm welcome for David Oliver. Music has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. I've played many instruments, but none quite as fascinating as the drums. I think they have the power to move a group of people. Native Americans would use huge drums, sending signals and making announcements to neighboring villages miles away. Drummers in the army would create strong driving beats to send soldiers into battle, risking their lives. Over the past months, I have explored what makes this instrument different. On the most basic level, the difference between drums and other instruments is that their pitch doesn't contribute to the melody. Rather, they play a rhythm behind it, giving it strength. When you play the drums, it's common to give a little tap or riff to indicate when you're moving into a new section. This gives players who are lost the opportunity to get back into the piece and stay with it. In further exploration, I found that a similar concept applies to having a productive life. I found I compared my day to day to music and where drums fit into it. I found that we, like music, work best in rhythms. I rely on concrete patterns to separate a normal day from freeform jazz. Thank you. Last year, we were given an inspiring speech by our next speaker's son. She has many years of acting that follows her, so she's no stranger to the stage. Often known for her vibrant and optimistic character in the community, tonight we will be hearing the vulnerable story of the accident that proved to be the test of a lifetime. I now give you Joyce Sherry. of the night phone calls rarely promise anything good. In my experience, they mean that someone has died, someone is stranded, or someone has to be bailed out of jail. On January, New Year's Eve, 2016, it was the news that our son, Jackson, had been in a car accident and was being rushed to the trauma unit at our local hospital. 
Jackson was a nuclear engineer on a Navy submarine, and he'd gotten home on leave just hours before. In typical adult child fashion, he had visited with us for an hour or two and then had met up with some friends down the coast to ring in the new year. One of the friends was a designated driver, and the plan was to camp overnight in his gutted, empty van. From what we know now, Jackson followed the plan, unrolling his sleeping bag in the back of the van and passing out. The others decided that it would be much more fun to continue the festivities at a party up a narrow, twisting canyon road. It's kind of amazing they made it as far as they did, given that when the police tested the designated driver, the designated driver, hours after the crash, his blood alcohol level was still over twice the legal limit. So when the twisty road went right, he went straight into a tree at 35 miles an hour. Our son, asleep in the back of the van, became a projectile. He was thrown forward to slam face first into the back of the front seats, then ricocheted off to smash back onto the floor. From there, it gets a little less clear, but here's what appears to have happened based on the Highway Patrol's investigation. The drunken idiots hauled him out of the van, dragged him across the ground, wrestled him into the back seat of another partygoer's car, and drove him to the hospital. Quick pause for a public service announcement. Never move an injured person ever wait for the professionals. At the hospital, the trauma doctors found that Jackson had a seven-inch gash exposing his skull from forehead to mid-scalp, a concussion, multiple broken ribs. His nose was shattered. His spine was broken in two places, and his spinal cord was damaged. He could neither move nor feel anything from the collarbones down. He was quadriplegic. And so began nearly five months of hospitalization and years of recovery. One memory that haunts my husband and me is watching our son turn cyanotic the lovely word for the blue shade that comes over someone as they suffocate to death, then being pushed out into the corridors and hearing the eerily calm voice saying, Code blue, I see you. Code blue, I see you. But stories of recovery are ones for another time because all of this was just to give you a background for why I hated Mikey, the designated driver who stole from Jackson his dreams of becoming a mountaineering guide and climbing the seven summits. And I did. I hated him. If I had to be in the same room with him, I couldn't look at him. My mouth would take on that weaned-on lemons look because what I really wanted to do was spit in his face. I would daydream about what I wanted to happen to him. I would lie awake at night imagining tortures just for him. The Spanish Inquisition had nothing on me. Oh... Every time I saw Mikey, I could hardly stand to look at him. That was not how Jackson felt. When Mikey asked to check in on him, first at the ICU and then at the VA spinal cord injury unit up in Palo Alto, Jackson welcomed the visits, laughing and talking and thoroughly enjoying himself. I couldn't understand it. Maybe there was even a part of me that disapproved of it, as if Jackson should feel as I did, angry, accusatory, unforgiving. 
I finally got up the moxie to ask, how can you be so friendly with him? Jackson's response? Oh, he didn't mean it. Mikey's a good guy. You have got to be kidding me. He didn't mean it? Mikey kept visiting every chance he got. If I was in the room, he'd look at the floor, knowing the hatred he would see in my face. But he kept coming, doing for Jackson everything he could. Meanwhile, I walked around with an alligator gnawing at my heart. Then one day, he came to the house. Mikey stood in our living room and joked and laughed with Jackson. There was such a feeling of camaraderie. I watched Jackson and I thought to myself, if he can forgive, who am I to cling to my anger? I looked Mikey full in the face for the first time since the accident. He ducked his head as usual, but I, I walked up to him. I stood on my tiptoes. I wrapped my arms around him and I gave him a squeeze. When I pulled away, he was grinning from ear to ear and his eyes glittered with tears. And me, well, frankly, I was a little surprised I'd just done that. But at the same time, it was like, you know that moment in the animated version of How the Grinch Stole Christmas, when we see the Grinch's heart grow three sizes? It was like that. It was such a relief. I felt dizzy. That's when I finally understood the saying that forgiveness isn't for the other person, it's for yourself. As much as Mikey was moved by the hug I gave him, it was nothing compared to the relief I felt at finally letting go of the tightness of anger and unforgiveness. I, I want to be really clear about this. What I offered Mikey in that moment was compassion. To be specific, forgiveness is the act of offering empathy, compassion, and understanding to the other person. None of this let him off the hook for a disastrous drunk driving accident that left a 23-year-old paralyzed. The legal system charged tried and convicted him, and he did time for breaking the law. But that was completely independent of our family and the forgiveness that we found for him. Forgiving is an act of courage. It means letting go of the idea that you are personally responsible for making someone else suffer. In fact, it means letting go of the idea that that person should suffer. The experience that Mikey had by doing time wasn't so that he could suffer, but so that he could learn. It takes constant self-reflection and strength to find empathy, compassion, and understanding for someone who has hurt you or someone you love. For me, I surprised myself when I found my own strength. There's plenty of research that shows us there's a huge benefit, both physiologically and neurologically, to forgiveness. Deep-seated, long-lasting anger can become toxic. It takes a, a toll on the tissues around the heart, on our gut health, even on our immune systems. And what about our mental health? We hear all the time about the effects of chronic strength, stress. The stress we experience from interpersonal conflict is intense and debilitating. Letting go of anger, hostility, and resentment actually makes us less anxious, less stressed. Our immune systems improve, and we can even have more energy for the good things in life. What I know is that letting go of my own anger, my hostility, my plans for a one-victim sherry inquisition 
has allowed me to open to the moments of love and togetherness that we have experienced as a family since January 2016. Had I been wrapped in a cloak of bitterness, could I have been present for Jackson as I have tried to be? I don't believe so. Scientists tell us that some people are naturally more forgiving than others. I think of Jackson immediately. But they also tell us that anyone can learn. Step one is simply to make the decision to let go of anger and resentment. There are several other practices, and I do emphasize the word practice, that can help. I'd like to offer you the chance to experience one that I have come to particularly love. It's a mindfulness-based practice called the loving-kindness meditation. We'll do a slightly abbreviated version with some of my own little adjustments. So if you'd like to give it a try, close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing that, or take a neutral gaze to the floor. Take a deep breath. And as you let it out, feel, feel yourself sinking into your chair. Call to mind the image of someone you care about. It can be a spouse, a, a child, a sibling, a friend, your pet. It doesn't matter. But hold the image in mind. Now think to that being silently. I wish you love with all my heart. I wish you joy with all my heart. I wish you peace with all my heart. Let the image of that being go. Take another deep breath. And as you let it out, feel yourself sinking even more deeply into your chair. Now call to mind the image of someone you're less than fond of. If this is the first time you've ever done this exercise, don't pick the worst person you know. Just go with someone who's mildly annoying. But hold that image in mind. And now think to that person. I wish you love with all my heart. I wish you joy with all my heart. I wish you peace with all my heart. Let the image of that being go. Take another deep breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes. That might have been challenging, but check in with your body. How does it feel? Do you feel a little more relaxed? Maybe lighter of heart? The people you love and care about will feel that change in you too. The absolute truth is that your forgiveness helps not only you, but your extended circle and their extended circle and their extended circle in a virtuous, expanding cycle of empathy compassion, and understanding. And that is a life change worth embracing.
Ever since she discovered the internet in middle school, having conversations at lunch about activism became a norm for our next speaker. Carrying this into the first couple years of high school, when junior and senior year came around, she was still seeking that greater purpose. Eventually, these ideas blossomed into a passion when she finally decided to put that act in activism. Please give a round of applause for Courtney Hand. In seventh grade, I found myself diving headfirst into the depths of the dark side of social media, the site that all your parents and teachers warned you about, Pinterest. Yes, I'm talking about the land of DIYs, recipes, and mommy bloggers. Although not the most conventional form of social media, my time soon became completely consumed with hours and hours spent on Pinterest. I might have learned a craft or two during my time on the site, but most of my time was devoted to scrolling through pins about my favorite books, art ideas, but most importantly, those related to social justice. With this new exposure, I began to learn the terminology of beliefs that I had always held, including that of feminism. I found myself vehemently standing up to small instances of sexism in my everyday life, and even having conversations at recess about feminism with my friends. To me, if anyone asked, I was quick to identify as a feminist later in eighth grade, even giving a small speech to my class about it. To me, my label of a feminist was a source of pride for me, a marker of my identity as an activist and a woman. It became so closely tied with my identity that my friend gave me a pin with the word feminist on it for my birthday. It was quickly a favorite, and I soon proudly displayed it on my pencil bag. As I got older, I was exposed to more people other than just the bubble of my old middle school. With this, I began picking up on other people's attitude towards the label of feminist, and was surprised to hear it in a somewhat derisive context. I began hearing the word to describe women who were loud, mean, angry and outspoken man-haters, and not at all in the manner of those who believed in gender equality. I was confused and frustrated by this attitude, as someone whose identity had become, become so closely tied with the word. It was as if someone had taken this integral part of my sense of self and twisted it into something that I could no longer understand. Because of this, I was tentative to identify as a feminist and began using a different pencil bag, one without my feminist pin shouting out for all to see. Because of the misconceptions surrounding the world, the shouting out for all the world to see. It hurt me that a part of myself that had been so crucial, a badge that I proudly wore, had been twisted and contorted into something that I couldn't recognize. But because of the misconceptions surrounding its meanings, I was scared to reclaim the label. Today, I see many of us adhere to different labels to gain a sense of identity, and in turn, use labels as weapons against those we don't identify with. These labels become markers of our identity and humanity, and because of this, we are quick to antagonize those who fall under a different label. For those who fall under a different label, we tend to forget their meaning, and instead perpetuate harsh assumptions, stereotypes, and hasty generalizations. When looking into the concept of polarization, I came across what is known as the robber's cave experiment. In the 1954 study, psychologists divided a group of fifth grade boys into two camps. The groups were separated in a remote park in Oklahoma, Robber's Cave State Park, hence the name. And during the first week, the boys spent time getting to know one another, bonding through activities such as hiking and swimming. To cement their commitment as a group, each chose a name. One group went by the Rattlers, while the others called themselves the Eagles. After this first week, the boys were informed of their neighboring camp, 
and we're presented with a series of competitions over the next few days with games such as baseball and tug of war. Animosity quickly spread between the groups, with some of the boys even getting into physical altercations. When finally separated and asked to describe the other group, the boys attributed members of their own group with positive qualities, while only describing the gr other group with negative language. Eventually, after manipulating the boys to grow to hate each other, the researchers attempted to lessen the divide, which was far overdue, considering that some of the boys had burned the flag of their counterpart, and some had ransacked the cabins of the others. Unfortunately, these opportunities, bonding opportunities that they provided, including activities such as a movie night or shooting firecrackers, didn't prove to be inconsequential and did nothing to actually repair that divide. To those of us who have gone through the ups and downs of 2020, not to mention January 6th and the rest of 2021 up until now, this study should come as no surprise. Today, I see to almost anyone, our, the divide in our country is as deep as ever. In the US especially, we tend to attach ourselves to certain labels and in turn, use the opposing labels as weapons against others. These similar to the fifth grade boys in Oklahoma, these labels become, we cling to these labels as markers of our position on politics, religion, social justice, and more. Although these labels can allow us to have a sense of clarity in ourselves in such a convoluted world, this clarity is often only extended to ourselves, and we fail to place the same careful discernment on others. It's easy to blame others for the divide in our country, and although our accusations may be accurate, they do nothing to actually reverse that divide. We are only responsible for our own actions, so that's where we'll have to start. When we give labels, we often simplify the complexities and humanities behind each individual that are identified with them. Although labels can unify, they can also allow for a sense of exclusion for those that don't feel fully accepted within the bounds of that language. Despite the growth of the movement for intersectionality, many people of color and those in the LGBTQ community feel excluded from the label of feminism, as in the past and unfortunately even now, it's been limited to the problems and advocate, advocacy of white women. As a white woman that would consider herself an intersectional feminist, it forces me to question whether the label is even necessary. And I'm sure like with any good TED talk, you're wondering, well, Courtney, what is the answer? What is the point of all this? Or have I just completely wasted my time? To answer the latter question, I really hope not. But to answer the former, I don't have the perfect answer. As with any complex issue, it's not as easy as just saying there's only one right answer. But before you label someone, anyone, no matter how inconsequential it might seem, pause for a moment. Is this label making it easier for you to perceive an individual or a group of people? Or is it just an easy way for you to avoid fully empathizing with those in question? I can't tell you much else beyond that. I can't spin it into an easy to read pin on Pinterest or a phrase on one of those cringy minion memes. The truth of the matter is, is that it shouldn't be this easy to understand. Thinking that this is just a black and white, right or wrong kind of issue defeats the purpose of it all. Things are never as clean as we might wish them to be. And we just have to accept that this issue is messy at its core. Being able to slap a quick label on something and call it a day only serves to create more issues. And we just have to recognize that this is complicated. So before you make a generalization on someone based on their label or classification, anything from political party to religion to whether or not they like pineapple on their pizza, which is obviously the superior pizza topping, question, question, question. 
You might not find the answer, but the process will enlighten you of your own biases and give room for more empathy. Thank you. Wow. We've heard stories from all ends of the spectrum tonight. We laughed together, we reflected together, and even shed some tears together. The common denominator in all of this is that we experienced tonight as a group. We experienced this whole year as a group. If you were to tell me a year ago that I would be right here addressing you all tonight, I wouldn't believe you. But I gotta say, this is the best possible ending to an historic school year, and I am so happy and ended in this way. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the sixth annual TEDx York School event, and it has been my honor to serve as your MC. Thank you so much, and I love you all. Thank you all.